how did it all start out from your perspective? I was uh, teaching at Cinema Makeup School and um, uh, enjoying teaching. I, I really do love and at this point miss teaching. And uh, my phone rang out of the blue and it was Mike Elizaldi. And Mike said, uh, hey, are, are you super busy and you want, do you want to come in and work at Spectral? And, I, and, and then he asked, he said, oh, will this interfe- interfere with the teaching? And I said, well, the thing about Cinema Makeup School is that they like to boast that they have working teachers. It's not retired teachers. It's people that actually still work and go out there and, and do jobs. So they would encourage me to take this job because what's good for me is good for them. So he said, great. He said, there's, a, there's several different shows. And he didn't tell me the titles or what they were. He, he said, this one is this much of a commitment. This much is this one. This one is this much commitment. So in a blind taste test, I said, well, the one that has this particular length of time sounds good. He said, great. He said, uh, can you come in Monday and we'll talk? I said, great. So I showed up. Uh, I told Cinema Makeup School, and of course, they were very like excited that I was going to go back out in the field. And I told them at the time, I said, well, you know, I should be back in a few months. I said, great. So I, I left and showed up to work on a Monday morning, and Mike said, job is lost in space for netflix and i was like wow really he was like yeah he said so we have some things that we want to talk about he said they originally the robot was going to be completely cgi and now they've gotten the uh the uh bill for what they think it will cost and they're saying "Hmm, what's the practical solution so the practical solution is to take a, a design that had been done by aaron sims and to uh, adapt it for a performer, a human performer. So I want to say that prior to my coming on to the show, Mike had pitched the suit performer Brian Steele, who is, in my opinion, one of the best suit performers out there, you know, for his particular size. I mean, you know, you certainly wouldn't cast Brian against... uh, um, uh, oh gosh, I, I lost his name just now. Doug, Doug, Doug Jones. Jones. Yeah. Doug Jones. Sorry, Doug. I love you. I really do. Sorry, I've been out in the sun all day. It's a long story. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, but you wouldn't cast them, you know, because Doug is an amazing suit performer. And there are a lot of amazing suit performers, but Brian seemed to be the, the right pick for this in terms of size and in terms of his commitment to the character. So um, uh, we they started out uh, by making. Uh, a proof of concept out of Scott foam. And what was interesting is Mike said, okay, the fabricators have put this together and you're coming in as your first day. I want you to look at it with fresh eyes and, and tell me if you think it works. So I walked in there without having seen anything and I saw what they were doing and I went, yeah, this works. It works really well. It's just, there's some of the proportions that I think we need to start monkeying with. It's, it's, it just needs to be proportionally fixed a little bit, but I do see the, the uh, merit in it. And uh, at the time, um, uh, the director was uh, Neil Marshall, and Neil was also one of the producers. And so Neil was in town, and he, uh, he wanted to come by and, and, and see Brian wearing this foam mock-up suit. So uh, we Got, you know, we made the alterations, we got Brian in the suit, and Neil came by and, and, like us, saw the potential and went, I, I think this is it. And Neil was very, very instrumental in, in trying to do as much practically as he could. And uh, for, you know, you'd have to talk to him about specifics, but I believe that he shares um, the, the, uh, the same kind of wonder and magic that comes with having something three dimensional, you know, in front of a camera versus virtual. So he was, you know, very, very, uh, uh, supportive of the entire process. And so, uh, then what happened is we started hearing from, uh, uh the rest of the, uh, of the producers, including uh, Zach Ephraim, who was the showrunner. 
And they said one of the things that they liked about the robot design and what Aaron Sims was trying to do was that they were trying to create hollows so that it you could just tell that there was not a man in a suit. It was not going to be a man in a suit. So it became, okay, how can we start camouflaging the fact that, that it is Brian? And uh, so there was lots of things in terms of the arms and, and hiding, you know, making an arm that has a, a designed in hollow in it and getting Brian's arm hidden in a part of it. There was, uh, there was the legs at one point, there was the same kind of design in the legs. And what became apparent was that if we layered things, that the more layers that there were, the more you might buy that you are not seeing one solid robot that could hide a man in a suit, but you were seeing layers of these like scales that were going to move on top of each other. So at the time, uh, uh, Don Lanning was working here on uh, some stuff for, uh, I want to say Bright. I think he had been working on Bright. So I kind of inherited uh, Don Lanning and Don was, you know, I told him, I said, listen, this is, they're talking about wanting to 3D print the entire suit. I said, I've already spoken to people, you know, and, you know, they told me that you know, it's not the, it's not just the price. It's, it's the turnaround time. I said, Don, I, I kind of need you to step up and sculpt it. Can you, can you sculpt the entire suit? So he said, yes. And he and, and Chad Washam and, uh, and, and even Miles Tevis sculpted a little bit on it. And, and they, you know, they just banged out the suit you know, pretty quickly. In the meantime, Claire Fluin and Bruce Mitchell and um, uh, the fabrication team, I think it was uh, Mike Passaretti and, oh gosh, if I can't remember his name, it will never speak to me again. I just said his name the other day. I'm an old man now. It's okay. I'll follow up on, on crew lists and stuff. Okay. Um, but but, but uh, 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 they, they were working out uh, these shell systems these we you know we, we call them shells we call them scales we call them shields i mean we you know we, we didn't know what to call them but there were this it was overlapping shells and the whole point was is that they would move on top of each other so bruce mitchell i think is the one that finally came up with the the, the systems that were really really going to kind of move and stretch on each other and still remain flat this is we couldn't have them puckering and sticking up in the air and uh and so he would design these these shells, and it was, Matt, I will tell you, it was a, I'm not going to say it was a nightmare, but it ended up being about 750 individual shells, and keeping track of all these pieces was insane. So, luckily, um, having taught at Cinema Makeup School and, and knowing that I had some very talented and ambitious students, I brought in a bunch of them and they began manufacturing shells. They were, uh, Bruce would sculpt out, uh, it was Bruce, Chad Walsham and, uh, uh, Claire and, oh gosh, uh, well, they would come up with the shape and then they would take that shape and they would mold the shape and they would make a vacuum form block and they would start vacuum forming them in series. And then these, these, Poor students of mine, these former students of mine, would have to cut every shape out, sand every one of them. It was like this big process. In fact, at one point, um, the entire uh, uh, writing staff, production staff, came to the shop to kind of see our progress. And uh, and they were looking at uh, Bruce and Claire um, putting all the, the shells, you know, on the on the stretchable foundations that would make them move. And they said, oh, my God, this is the worst job in Hollywood. And I said, no, 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 no. Come with me and I'll show you the worst job in Hollywood. And I took them into where these students were sitting around a table, cutting out, sanding all these buckets and buckets of scales. And they agreed, yes, this is the worst job in Hollywood. It's the absolute <laughs> worst job in Hollywood. So, um, but but and listen, it was a smile on their faces, worked every day. It was a tremendous, it was a tremendous uh, uh, effort. So what would happen is I, I would, uh, you know, I would walk in the door, you know, in the morning and I'd go, okay, 
21 work days left, 21 work days. And I would walk out and, and they would just know, you know, it was like, it was like the, the guy on the ship beating the drum while everyone's paddling. It's like, you know, we just had to keep, we had to just keep staying on schedule, keep staying on schedule. In the meantime, they had, there was a couple of things that they asked for that were uh, challenging. One of them was uh, uh, the head, because even though we started off and they had signed off on a head, they, they didn't like it. There was, there was all sorts of conversations about what the robot's head should look like. And uh, it was, it got to the point where I literally sat with Don Lanning and I said, Don, can we do this like a police sketch? Can I bring them in? And you sit there at your table with Clay and with them standing there, go, you know, do this, do that, do this. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And literally that's how it was done. They, 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 uh, you know, they, they all came in um, and they stood around Don. Don's head with a big lump of clay there. And uh, Lars, um, uh, I, I, I will have to uh, spell his name because I can't pronounce it. It is a, a Norwegian name. Uh, his name is uh, Jangard, J-A-N-G-A-A-R-D, Lars Jangard. Lars had been working on the other challenge, which was they wanted, um, instead of having to CGI over the faceplate, they wanted like a screen on his face that would be showing some kind of abstract um projection on it so Lars had to figure that out but more about that in a second so um he had Don had like a vacuum form of the of the face and literally with everyone standing around him he they would say okay uh, you know put put more divisions on top of the head okay that's too many divisions make them wider okay make them thinner okay they're too thick okay now that's good okay now let's work on this and um, they finally got it whittled down to a point where they were all happy and they walked out. And it was like, I, and Don Lanning, God bless him. I, he was, he was magnificent. That's all I can say. He, he really handled them well. He never got frustrated, never lost his temper. He just sat there and just let them, let them kind of riff with their ideas. And he would just, and he was flushing them out at the same time. So what Lars had been working on was this, this projection system. So at the time, the, the, smallest, um, the smallest projector that you could find was, um, it was like a, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of a comparison. It was probably about ooh, nine inches long by about three and a half inches wide, about a half, three quarters of an inch thick. And, and on, to make matters worse, the the projector was not in the center it was offset so we were trying to figure out a way to mount this on brian Steele's uh brian Steele's um uh what do you call it his head his head shell uh, his underskull excuse me that was wrong with me his underskull but so lars had given don a physical representation of this and said whatever you sculpt it has to be larger than this. And so when Don was there with all the producers and directors, if he hit that little block, he would say, guys, you can't go any deeper. This is, you know, the projector's there. So, um, and in fact, this is just so strange. Uh, you know, Lars was telling me, well, the big problem is, is, you know, this projector is sitting up on top of Brian's head and it's at an angle. And so we have to spread the actual projected image on this dome surface. So in order to do that, we need to, we need to put a lens in front of it. And frankly, I don't know where to start. So I went home and I grabbed, uh, a 35 millimeter Pentax K 1000 lens that had not been out of a camera case in about 20 years. And I brought it to Lawrence and I said, here, you can have this take it apart, see what you can find. And so kind of through trial and error, Lars would, you know, put different sections of these lens glasses, you know, in front of this projector until he got the right throw on the dome. So, uh, you know, and, and towards the end, uh, I mean, it was really great. I mean, I will be honest with you and say that a lot of it was replaced digitally. 
uh, for two reasons. One, they changed the content. So originally, at one point, they gave us like, oh, we're thinking about something like this. So they sent us a bunch of a bunch of videos, which Lars would literally project off of his phone onto the projector, onto the face of the robot. I mean, he literally would just do it from his phone. But then uh, a guy named Tim Lamb stepped in, and Tim and Lars kind of came up with a system that would run the projector onto uh, onto I mean off of a laptop. And uh, also uh, Nicholas Podbury up in uh, up in Canada of Amazing Ape, he was also very instrumental in that as well. But uh, irregardless, um, we got it all working, and and the only problem was is that we couldn't fight the sun. We couldn't find a projector that was brighter than the sun that would fit in a nine by four by you know three quarters of an inch rectangle. I don't know why, because you'd think that they would have things as bright as the sun that small that could run on batteries that could be replaced, <laughs> but we couldn't. So there was always that, hey, we can't see the projector in the sun. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of things you can't see when you're looking in the sun, and this is one of them. So those shots they did have to replace uh, digitally. And in fact, you know, we're we're, talk, we're prepping um, uh, season two, and it was the first thing they asked. They said, hey, you know, any change in projectors? Can we uh, can we shoot them out in the sun? No. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be CGI. If you're out in the sun, it's going to be CGI. Just has to be, and that's that's what that's what CGI is for. It's exactly for that. So um, we uh, ran the suits all in foam latex. You know, uh, Brian. I mean, the undersuit that that Don Lanning sculpted. Um, meanwhile, before I came on board, um, they had uh, designed some completely mechanical arms for the robot from like the elbow down, and uh, they. I want to say that Brian was going to carry 18 servos on his back to make these very alien hands work. And uh, as we got closer and Brian was, you know, coming in for fittings and they would come in and see Brian in different aspects of the suit, it became abundantly clear that they wanted Brian to operate his own arms. So like at the 11th hour, we had to make arms that Brian could operate and these very expensive, very technical arms that would have required at least two, if not three puppeteers, uh, were scrapped, were scrapped. And, um, which I think was better for Brian because he wasn't carrying the servos and he wasn't carrying the batteries and all that on his back. And instead he himself was motivating the hands and motivating the arms and, you know, it made it a lot easier for him just to reach out and grab things. And from what I heard, cause we weren't on set, um, what I heard, he, he really did very well. I mean, if, if the show was any indication, he did great. You know, I never see him, you know, fumbling around for anything, but, you know, that's editing. Um, so uh, that was, during during the, the prep, I got a call, and they said, hey, listen, we want to know what Canadian company you'd like to work with. And um, now we're going to get into some reality. This is going to be some this is going to be real. So uh, those of you who are faint of heart need not listen. Come, come back in five minutes. But the, uh, but the, but the, uh, so they sent me some, some websites of some very talented um, uh, Canadian special effects artists. And uh, the, the page, the one page that really impressed me the most was a company called Amazing Ape. And it was uh, Nicholas Podbury, Werner, oh, I can't think of, oh, Pretorius. And Richard, oh, Richard, I can't forget your last name now, buddy. I apologize. It was their the page, and I thought they were really terrific. And I said, these are the guys you, we want to work with for sure. Well, that changed to these are the guys that will be doing the show. And uh, you will fly up to Canada. You will show them how everything works, and they will do it. And so it was disappointing, honestly, for us because we had you know worked so hard on these suits. In fact, we got – Two suits made, so you have two suits with heads and projectors, and you know each one of them with 750 scales on them. You know, and uh, you know with Brian Steele, who would be coming in for fitting after fitting, and you know Claire and Bruce and all of us uh, 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 working so hard on it, and um, you know to know that we were going to turn it over to a Canadian crew. So I uh, 
contacted Nicholas Padre and uh, and said, uh, "Hey, you know, Nick, you know, this is this is what we've been told." And he was uh, a, just nothing but a gentleman about the entire situation. And uh, uh, eventually, Claire and uh, and Bruce and I flew up to uh, work with uh, uh, Nicholas and Werner and Richard for about a week, showing them how everything went together. You know, teaching them how everything worked. And, and, and again, they were just 100% awesome. They were so great and, again, so just so generous and just so respectful. And uh, we all kind of were like, well, at least it's in good hands. You know, at least the robot's in good hands. And, and you know, as the show went on, I'd get a call from, from Nicholas and he'd say, oh, this is going on. And we'd talk it out and try to figure it out together. And a lot of times they would just, you know, they're, all, they're the boots on the ground guys. If there was a problem, then they had to step up and, make sure it worked, you know, and, and they did, and they did, I mean, like, as evidence from the show. So, um, it's the, the suit was painted by, uh, a gentleman named Neil Wynn, Neil, uh, who is who, one of the main painters here at Spectral Motion. And, uh, that, that in itself was, you know, uh, kind of a, you know, a typical motion picture, you know, show us, show us colors. This is what we're thinking. And, you know, painting, a whole series of scales and different combinations of colors. But I mean, and I don't know if the public ever picked up on this, but the whole idea is that the robot's metallic color is kind of like this copper color. And he has like that kind of blue, blue metallic silvery coating on it, which is why the edges of every one of his scales is that copper color. Like it's been punched out. Like the metal was coated with this blue and then a big industrial press went, ka-ching, 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 and just cut him, cut up the scales, which is why he has that, that the beautiful kind of like copper outline and everything, which I think looks amazing. I really am a huge fan of it. And Neil and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Bree Ford and Mark Jarenko, you know, and, and again, when it came time to painting all that stuff, that all the students who had been sanding scales sat down and started masking scales so that they could be painted, all the copper could be painted. And I mean, they did a beautiful job. And, and one of the last things that uh, was this was this whole um, the whole chest, which I again I thought was amazing. Uh, um, it was a Don sculpted. Uh, over the, the foam latex suit, this this big fiberglass. It, well, it was cast in fiberglass. This big fiberglass uh, uh, chest. That, uh, uh, by the way, all the mold work and everything was supervised by Brian Ray. Brian and I had worked together, you know, in the, in the old days of K and B, and, and and he was the mold shop supervisor here, and and just, you know, he never never misstep. Everything was just right on the money, like you know, and and, and I would just. I can't tell you the amount of, of uh, aplomb it took just to make, go up to Brian and go, Brian, this has to be molded today. You know, we need a fiberglass piece out tomorrow. And go, okay. And you know, God bless him that we get done. And just boom, turning it around. We turned around those two suits. I started October 7th, 2016. I started October 10th. We were up in Canada with the first suit the first week of January, the train, that was how quickly the turnaround was. And, and that's what I'm saying. So it wasn't like, you know, you've got six months to figure this out. I mean, everything was done on the fly. You know, everything was like, okay, how do we make this work? How do we make this work? How do we make this work? And, uh, I, I really was impressed because I had never worked here at spectral motion before. And so I was the pretty much the odd man out. There were some people who had, who were new to the studio as well, but, by and large, this, this was a this was a, a team, you know. This was a, a well-oiled machine that I walked into, and, and they trusted me, and in turn, I trusted them. And at the end of it, we were all very proud of what we had done. It really, it was an amazing. It was an amazing experience. So, 